Well, last week, if you were here with us, we began our new series um, that we've been calling the Disciplines of Grace. And if you remember, we talked about how we're, we're looking at these disciplines not as a means of salvation. That is a grace that we is unearned and it's un, God's unmerited favor to us, accomplished through the cross and by his resurrection. And yet what allows us or what helps us, I should say, if I, and the way I think of it in my head is it kind of tunes me into that grace, helps me live in light of that grace, is, is some of these practices and these routines and these habits that we can build into life. They, they serve to help us understand it deeper, to live in it uh, more fully, and to demonstrate it more generously to the people around us. Uh, so last week, when we were talking about this, we talked about the discipline of gratitude. And one of the things that, that is our heart's desire in this is that this wouldn't just sort of be theoretical for us, but that we would talk about very specific ways that we could apply this in our lives um, and, and practices that we could at least sort of experiment with to see if that helps take us to a deeper place. And so last week I suggested that over the course of the next five days that you would just keep a gratitude journal, we call it, whether it was on your phone or actually physically in a journal, just mark down a few things, five things that you were grateful for that day. And then the next day, look for five new things. So I'm just curious, how did that go? Anybody feel like they, okay, all right. <laughs> Yeah, it was interesting. It was an interesting experiment for me. It's not a habit that I do regularly. Um, but it was a couple things that, that stood out to me in the midst of it that, that I felt like I was learning. One was how just even a little bit of effort to be aware of gratitude changed how much I saw. It, 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 I realized, recognized, like th even throughout the day thinking like, oh, I got to remember to write this down tonight. I was like, oh, that was really cool. Like that, that I got that. Um, so there was much more that was happening around me that evoked a sense of gratitude in me that I, that I was not keenly aware of when I'm not looking for it. But the second thing that, that emerged for me in that was how much of what I saw that I was grateful for was people. Um, some of you all, honestly, that just God had put my life, my path that day, had done something kind or generous or whatever. And I was like, wow, they didn't have to do that. Um, but they did, and, and my heart just sort of overflowed with, with gratitude in the midst of that. I got one uh, cute little uh, text messages from uh, one of our, our little ones. Uh, his parents text messaged me. Um, Graham, actually, Rishi, has kept his gratitude list this week, and he had, um, he had playgrounds on there, um, dad, and cheese, which was also on my gratitude list. So we... <laughs> shared a lot in common this week, but I love, I love the idea of us practicing, this, practicing these things together as, as family. And I talked about, I told you this story last week, how um, Sherry, in fact, I was leaving after service, I was gonna go pick her up at the airport, and how she had been gone for the week, and how my, my sense of gratitude for who she is and what she does for our family had increased throughout the week because of the absence of that in my life. I became more keenly aware of how much she does on a daily basis for our family because I was trying to fill in those gaps as best that I could, right? And that whole experience got me thinking a little bit. Why does she do those things? Like, what, what is it that motivates her to, to do all of the things that I was now observing happen in our life that most of the time I, I pass right by without ever saying thank you for or out ever responding to or honestly out ever seeing most of the time. Like what, what is behind all of that? And as I was thinking about that, I mean, sure, some of it is, is sheerly pragmatic, right? Th doing things that have to be done, but it's, it's motivated out of love. It's her love for our family that, that, that causes her, that motivates her, compels her to do all of these things for us on a regular basis. And it's happening around us all the times. And re the reality is most of the time I go through every day of my life with these things happening and out ever taking time to see it, to, to notice it. In some ways, there's this condition in us. If we remember, we talked about those 10 lepers that Jesus heals and one comes back and, and nine of them experience this, this, 
miraculous thing, and yet they failed to connect it to the love and the grace that motivated it, and therefore re- failed to respond in gratitude. And I recognize that condition in my own heart that we can battle with it. But as I was considering how these things are happening all around me every day in this human relationship, it, it, it caused me to consider this larger question. That what if, what if the almighty creator God is speaking, what, what if he is displaying his love for us all the time, all around us, and we're missing it? What if it's, it's happening and we're not seeing it? See, today we're, we're going to talk a little bit about the spiritual discipline of what we call noticing. The spiritual discipline of noticing. And I want to begin this morning just by establishing a basic definition of this discipline. So the practice of noticing is actively seeing or acknowledging God and his handiwork and his created world around us. Actively seeing or acknowledging God and his handiwork and his created world around us. And I, and I think it's important as we talk about this, that we recognize that what we're talking about is, is intentional and purposeful. That each of these disciplines, as, as we kind of break these down, these require us to reject passivity in order to gain a fuller awareness of God's grace in our lives. See, Jesus, when he is on a hillside outside of Galilee, and he's got this group of people who have responded to his message, and they've, they've chosen to follow him. They want to live as an apprentice. They want to follow the way of Jesus. This is the same language that we talk about what we're doing here in the church, who we want to be, and he's teaching them, and he's addressing the topic or the issue of worry. And as he's teaching them to live in alignment with these kingdom values and how to overcome worry, he teaches them this discipline of of noticing. Let's turn to the gospel of Matthew. This is in Matthew chapter 6. This is from what's commonly referred to as the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is a series of teachings of Jesus where he's modeling and teaching and demonstrating what life in his kingdom looks like and how do we live that out in obedience to him. And this is what he says. This is in verse 25 of chapter 6. He says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food? and the body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And are you not much more valuable than they? And can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the fields grow. They do not labor or spend, and yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. And if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, will he not clothe, uh, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So why does, why does Jesus here, when he's sitting with all of these disciples and he wants to help teach them on how to overcome, how to get beyond, live um, outside of worry in their lives? Why does he, why does he teach them to, to merely look around? He says, look at the birds of the air. See, see the flowers of the field. So once again, what I would like to do this morning, I want to just take a couple moments to make a couple observations here. And then I want us to spend a little bit of time just talking about how we might experience this this week, how we might integrate this into our own walks with Jesus. And, and I really, there's a couple things that I, I want to highlight. First, there's a couple perspective shifts that I think Jesus is leading us to, because Jesus is applying this to worry here. I think it, it, it applies to much more than just worry. I think it's a practice that actually speaks into multiple areas in our lives. So I want to look at these perspective shifts, and then I want to look at, at just one sort of result of, that emerges from this. So let's begin by, by looking at the perspective shift of uh, the value comparison. The value comparison. We all know what it's like, right, in life when we have 
people around us that we care about that are sort of in our inner circle and and we treat them differently than we treat anybody else that that comes around that circle like we have special privileges that we give to our family or our kids or that sort of thing that maybe we wouldn't do for everybody else i think that's i mean i don't think any of us would would counter that right i remember growing up um i had a big family and my my grandma gracious loved the lord very very good to me um but i wasn't my older brother right he was grandkid number one in this and so our birthdays were right next to each other in, in the month of november and so oftentimes our family birthday parties were combined parties and i i can still remember my grandma sort of pulling me aside and just saying like, okay, um, I want you to know that this is a big year for Scott. He's turning seven, you know, <laughs> and, and so that's why you might look at his present and see that it's a little bit bigger than yours. And it's just because this is, this is kind of a big year. You're like, okay, you know, like I can understand it. And then eventually like after this, I was like, shouldn't I be coming into these big birthday years that like, <laughs> And I, I, that's an that's a exaggeration for the sake of effect here, but you, you, you get the point, right? Like, we treat people differently. Like, the American Express, for instance, they used to have a slogan that says, membership has its privileges. That, that people that are a part of, in this community, in this group, there's access for them that isn't granted to everybody else. And this seems to be the point that Jesus is making here. He, he is using this uh, teaching method that rabbis would often use where they talk about something that is lesser in order to give understanding to that which is greater. And we have to remember that the crowd that is surrounding Jesus, that's hearing him teach and talk about this, these are their very real concerns. Th these are the fear that they're facing in their life is what am I gonna, where am I gonna sleep tonight? Am I gonna have something to wear tomorrow or where is my next meal going to come from? Jesus is speaking into the fear of his life. These aren't theoretical questions. And Jesus responds in the midst of all of that and he says, look around you. Yeah, I want you to see something as ordinary and as everyday as the birds that are, that are all around you. And I want you to see that they have what they need. He says, they do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And then just immediately following that, he makes this value comparison here. He says, aren't you much more valuable than they? I want you to see what I'm able to do for them. I want you to look at this and take it in, understand what's unfolding around you. And he says, if I am willing to do all of this for this element, these these." aspects of my creation that do not carry the image of God in them, then certainly I am able and willing to do this for you. See, there seems to be two fundamental things that, that Jesus wants them to understand in the midst of this. The first is that he, he appears to want to re just remind them of some basic essential truths. Truths about who God is, the truth about what he's able to do, the truth of who they are in light of all of that. And he's saying that there's evidence of that. There's, there's, there's visual reminders all around you of these truths, and I want you to stop and to take them in. And then he says, I'm doing all of this. I want you to do this because this is meant to be a means for you to, to receive comfort. What is his motivation in telling them to look at the birds of the air or the lilies of the field? He, he's seeking to teach them to understand why they don't need to worry. That the underlying truth of what they look around them and observe is that, is that they can trust him with every aspect of their lives. So all of this isn't just some sort of object lesson that Jesus is laying out in front of these followers. He's saying these things that you see and that you observe, this is meant to inform how you live. Now, I, I, will, I will be the first to admit that I do not spend the majority of my life in this conscious awareness of, of the beauty and the order and the creativity and the design and the care that surrounds me every day, but it's there. 
I just don't take time to see it. Like, I, 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 in my mind, I use that excuse like, oh, the people that live like on the beach, right? Like, they're the ones who need to be doing this. Like, they wake up. And honestly, if, if that was your reality, that would become your normal, and, and all of a sudden, that wouldn't impress you, right? Like, the reality is, is that it's all around us, and I'm just not taking the time to see it. God has put these reminders of his care and his provision and his ability, and he does so so that I will understand that, that, that me as a image bearer of the almighty God, that I'm so much more valuable to him than these things. And if he is able to do this for these aspects of creation, then how much more is he able to do for me? And sometimes I don't see it, but I need to see it. He wants me to see it because in seeing it, I see him. And that's what Jesus appears to be driving us towards. Some people talk about this spiritual discipline uh, with the Latin phrase visio divinia or, or translated holy seeing, right? And simply put, that's the idea of, of praising and praying to God with our eyes. Praising and praying to God with our eyes. And as Jesus taught this practice to his followers, he did so as, as a means of them remembering of who God is, his care and his provision, and for them to understand you, understand how valued and loved they are. But there's this, this second shift, this perspective shift that we see happening here that Jesus is directing us towards. And that is what I'm just gonna call the grandeur of our God. The grandeur of, of our God. I uh, leave tomorrow morning I have the privilege of joining our, our student ministry team um, with my oldest daughter heading down to Ecuador. And um, I'm excited for the time, I'm excited for this experience with, with Emma and to, to be able to um, go together. And I remember several years ago when I was leading a, a group of students, one of the things that we do on this trip is that we go into the jungle and you've heard me tell stories about this before, but. On this one particular time, um, one of our group leaders led us up to the side of this hill in the jungle. And um, most of the time when you're in the jungle, all you see is what's immediately in front of you because it's dense and it's thick and, and there's beauty and order and creation all, it's amazing. That's one of the top five experiences I've ever seen in, in my life. But at this particular time, he took us up to this, this kind of resort thing that was being built in the middle of the jungle and there's this overlook. And we walked out to this overlook. And I put this view up here. This is, this is not exactly the view from where we were, but this, this reminds me very, very much of what I saw. And I, I like my breath was literally like taken away. Like I was just in, in awe because as far as my eyes could see, the expanse just led out over, over this beautiful, these, these tributaries that are leading to the Amazon and and do you know what I felt in that moment, in that space? I felt tiny. Not, not like in an insignificant kind of way, like in appropriately understanding my scale kind of way. Like we live most of our lives in house and cars and it, it, all, everything built for us. In that moment, I saw something that was built for someone much bigger than me, by someone much bigger than me. And I understood it. And, and, and see, look at what, what Jesus is pointing. This is in verse 28 and 29. He says, why do you worry about clothes? See, see how the, the flowers of the field grow and they do not labor or spin? And yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. Here, here, so Jesus is now giving us a second value comparison. But instead of now sort of looking at mankind and as it relates to the rest of creation, he is pointing ourselves to the scale of who God is and he's using the same teaching methodology. He's taking something lesser and it's pointing to something greater, but this time the lesser that he is using to point to the greater is King Solomon. Like if you, you in the mind of a, a first century Jewish person, you could not imagine somebody who had more resource or, or more wealth, more ability than Solomon in their history. If we were to take Bill Gates and, and Warren Buffett and they pulled their resources together, like this is just starting to get to the idea of how they understood Solomon's ability. 
And so Solomon is used as the example of, of the lesser, of the one who is lacking. He's saying, despite all of this capacity, despite every luxury being afforded to him, despite having more resources than we could possibly humanly ever imagine his ability to clothe himself in beauty, it pales in comparison to the flowers that are surrounding you on the hillside right now, to what our God is able to do. To get here, the, the, the point isn't that we would feel insignificant. Jesus has already spoken into how deeply valued and cared for we are. The, the point is, is that he wants them to understand how wonderful he is. He, he's directing them to a scale of their God that is, that is beyond their ability to comprehend. So he's just saying in this, in this small way, Imagine all these resources, all this disposal, all of this sort of um, ability that you would see in a human form, and it's just, it's just an iota of what our God is able to do. See, Jesus, is, he's expanding their vision on the grandeur of their God. In Psalm chapter 24, the psalmist simply says it this way, and I love this. He says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. It all belongs to him, and it's at his disposal. David, in, in Psalm chapter 8, in fact, let's turn over there real quickly. In Psalm chapter 8, he, he seems to capture this sort of, the, both sides of this coin that Jesus is talking about in these perspective shifts here. I'm going to pick it up in verse 3. He says, when I consider your heavens and the work of your fingers and the moon and the stars which you have set in place... What is mankind that you're mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. So he begins by just this effervescent sort of expression of, of God's grand scale of understanding his own sort of humility in light of all of that. But then he continues. He says, there's this other side of this coin. You've made them, meaning humanity, a little lower than the angels. You've crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands and put everything under their feet. And so he's looking at the, the birds of the air and the lilies of the field and saying, in comparison to that, look at this, what you have done for us. All the flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea and all that swims the paths of the seas. Lord, oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth? Adele um, Calhoun, Calhoun um, who's an author, and she's written on, on spiritual disciplines, and she's written about this practice or this integrating this practice of visio divinia or holy seeing into our lives. She writes this. She says, creation speaks. It speaks eloquently. It pours forth speech of God. God ambushes people in riverbanks and mountaintops and wilderness wastelands, whirlwinds, burning bushes, and rushing winds. She says, the house of God stretches from the view out my window to the edge of the universe and beyond, and all I have to do is see it. All I have to do is see it. See, Jesus, when he, he directs our attention to the birds of the air and the lilies and the grass, he does so in order for us to understand how valuable we are to him and how magnificent he is to us. Because when I lose sight of those things, when, when, when I forget those things, my tendency is to make too much of myself or too little of him. And so he says, look around you. See order and beauty and design and creativity because it's revealing something to you about who I am. So now let's take just a minute here to talk about this response that emerges from all of this when we take time to see it. And that's just a, a response of uninhibited worship. Uninhibited worship. I um, um, came across a story recently where the Washington Post, this has been a while back now, they did sort of a social experiment. And they took um, Joshua Bell, some of you might be familiar with him, he's, he's a world-class violinist um, and, and plays in concert halls and all around the world. And they took him and, and they put him in the um, subway station at Washington, D.C. 
And he was playing um, for the 30 to 45 minutes of rush hour when literally more than a thousand people were passing him by and he's playing some of the most complicated um, violin pieces by Bach that, that have ever been written. And most people walked right by. The, the very best of the very best. Playing a Stradivarius violin that's worth three and a half million dollars. And, and the vast majority of the people, as they're standing in the midst of greatness, they don't recognize it. They, they didn't even see it. In fact, one of the interesting things about this, and I think this actually is it's instructive to us, is that most of the people who stopped to listen were children. Like their, their ability to, to recognize beauty and greatness, being in the presence of greatness seemed to be heightened. And then perhaps maybe the distractions that we live with as adults, our, our senses are dulled to that. Because just days before this, Joshua Bell had played a sold out um, show in the city of Boston, where people were there fully aware of being in the presence of, of greatness, fully aware of what they were witnessing and seeing. And as all of that is unfolding as these finishing of show, everyone rises to their feet and they applaud and they shout and they, they worship, right? They worship Joshua Bell because they have just experienced something incredible, but what was right there in front of them when it was free to them, all around them, they just walked by because they didn't see it. In, in Psalm chapter 19, David again writes this. He says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech and night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech and they use no words, no sound that's heard from them and yet their voice goes out into all the earth, the words to the end of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for his son, for the son. It's like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run its course. And it rises at one end of the heavens and it makes its circuit to the other and nothing is deprived of its warmth. See, here's David appears to be in a place where he is being overwhelmed by the beauty and the creation and the provision and it responds in this, this overflow, this poetic expression of worship to how good God is. The heavens declare your glory, he says. The skies proclaim the work of your hands. And Voskamp who wrote a book um, entitled 1,000 Gifts, which is an excellent resource as it relates also to gratitude, what we talked about, about this week or last week, but she also says this in this practice of noticing. She says, all beauty is only a reflection. And whether I am conscious of it or not, any created thing of which I am amazed, it is the glimpse of his face to which I bow down. I couldn't agree more. You see, the perspective shift that, that Jesus gives us here when he teaches us to actively see, actively acknowledge God and his handiwork and creation all around us. He does so in order that we might understand how loved and valued we are by the omnipotent, the unlimited creator God whose canvas is the landscape, the sunset, and the person sitting next to you. And when we notice it, when, when, when we take time to see it, we are free to worship him with, without those restrictions on us because we're aware that we're standing in the presence of greatness. And so I, I began today with a question. What, what if the almighty creator God, what if he is speaking? What if he is displaying his love for us all around us all the time? See, Jesus, Jesus is teaching us to see it so that in seeing it, we might be transformed by it. So I'm gonna invite the, the worship team to come up and we're gonna respond in worship. And as, we, as they come up, I just want us to think about a way to integrate this into our routine this week. And I would encourage you this week as, as you continue um, the, the gratitude journal, I don't want you to, to just let go of that, but as you think about this, I just want you to write down, jot down sort of an inventory of where you saw or discovered or perceived the order, the design, the care, the beauty that is on display all around you. 
Tomorrow, where did you see his presence and his activity and his goodness? Like acknowledge it, write it down, put, put a reminder. And then if possible, if there's any way, I want to, I want to just add an element of community into this. If you, if you can sit down as a family over dinner, if your small group is meeting or just friends getting together for lunch, if there's an element of community that you have to just maybe ask yourselves the question, hey, where did you guys, where did you guys see God's work today? Where did you discover or, or notice his handiwork? And just, just track it. Just keep track of it. Because it's going to show you, again, how loved and valued you are, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to show us how great he is. And when we get both of those things, we're going to worship him. Now let's do that now. Worship with us.